Airbags. Some people love them, some people hate them. In today's episode, we are going to install a bunch of race car safety equipment into the E36 and talk about why race cars ditch the factory airbag system. Welcome to Mastering Every Turn, where my goal is to turn my BMW E36 into a multi-motorsport machine. I plan on competing in drifting, rally events, hill climb racing, drag racing, and much more, all with this one car. And in order to comply with the rules, we gotta make sure it's legal to even be on track in the first place. Or off track. But before installing all the safety equipment, Let's back up a little bit and let me catch you guys up on how this car even got to this point in the first place. So a few months ago, I had dropped the car off when it was a bare rolling shell with Mike Robinson from MSR Performance. He is an amazing fabricator who specializes in roll cage design and fabrication. And with that introduction, Mike, take it away. All right, so I'm Mike Robinson, uh, owner of MSR Performance. Uh, as you can see by Ethan's car here, I build roll cages for a living. Uh, I build roll cages for SCCA Hill Climbs, Lemons, uh, SCCA Road Race, NASA Road Race, Pikes Peak, uh, pretty much you name it, uh, I've probably built a cage for it. Besides that, I'm very heavily involved in SCCA Hill Climbs. Um, I'm a novice instructor, I'm also one of the tech inspectors. So you'll see on Ethan's car here, uh, Ethan's trying to do a little bit of everything with the car. Uh, he's not building it for one particular purpose. Uh, he's trying to do hill climb with it. He's trying to do some NASA r racing with it, possibly some lemons. So this one's a little bit unique of a cage, uh, trying to please all the rule sets for, for everything. It's really not that hard to do. Um, basically, you just pick the hardest rule set that there is that's the most intrusive and you build that. And then you add any required tubes that may be specialty for any other sanction that you're, you're trying to do. This particular one was actually a lot of fun though. Uh, Ethan gave me basically a car launch to do whatever I wanted with it as long as it passed tech. So we did NASCAR style door bars on it. Lower rocker bars are welded to the rocker plus the cage itself. It's going to get gusset plates right up along the A pillar here. It's going to get some gusset plates along the B pillar. Uh, it's really going to help tighten up the chassis quite a bit. Uh, no more flex in this thing. All right, that's really about it. The rest is going to be on him to finish the car. Thanks. So with a big thank you to Mike Robinson from MSR Performance, we can successfully check off the cage on the safety equipment checklist. Other than having the cage welded in, all we really did was paint the interior of the car. We stripped out some of the sound deadening with some dry ice, try and lighten up the chassis a little bit. Following painting the interior of the car, we also painted the exterior. Nothing fancy, we are not professional painters, but we just wanted the race car to be one color before it gets the full crazy livery with all the stickers and everything. So as you can see, that's all we did. We threw up a tent, we got the spray in, and we got it done. So other than the cage, the first thing we're going to be installing in the E36 is a system that you really, really hope you never ever have to use, but God forbid you do have to use it, it'll save your butt in the long run. And that is a fire suppression system. For the E36, I purchased Lifeline's Fire Zero 2000 Fire Marshal Fire Suppression System Kit. Man, is that a mouthful, but it is not a lot of money. It is a great budget kit for anybody looking to get a system put in their car. It does not have the fancy electronics. It's all regular pool cords. It gets the job done and it keeps you safe, most importantly. To explain the simplicity of how a fire suppression system works, I'm going to put us in the ultra realistic situation where you are racing Max Verstappen in his RB16. Now unfortunately, your car cannot quite keep up the same pace that Max Verstappen can, and during its triumphant struggle, it pops a fuel leak and catches on fire. Luckily, on board you have your fire suppression system, and you or your passenger can use either the pull cords and pull the cords, releasing all of the fire retardant material that is inside of the tank. It shoots through the hoses, out the nozzles, and sprays all over the fire, keeping you and your passenger safe. Now, in terms of installing the kit in the E36, it was an absolute breeze. The only few things we had to actually check off, since this is only a two nozzle kit and not like a three nozzle or a four nozzle, is one, the tank had to be by the driver within arm's reach so I could prime the tank by pulling the pin before going out on track. Secondly, in terms of the lines and the fittings, I needed at least one at the driver and at least one in the engine bay pointing towards a fuel source or a heat source, for example, a turbo or a fuel rail. Now, as a side note, I did not install the pool cables yet, and the reason for that is because in a previous car that I had built, I installed the pool cables before putting in the entire interior, and we accidentally pulled one of the cables one day installing a set of wires, and you can guess what happened next. 
Needless to say, we will not be repeating that. I'm going to make that one of the final things we install so that way no mishaps happen ever again. So with the fire suppression system fully installed in the car, we can now move on to the next safety checklist item, which is one so simple yet so effective at doing its job to keep you safe. And that item is safety nets. So we'll keep safety nets short and sweet as their job is quite simple, but also very important. Their sole purpose is to keep your hands, arms, legs, and feet inside the ride at all times. God forbid you have a big accident on track, whether you roll or just get a big impact. The safety net is designed to have a little bit of give, but enough strength to keep you inside the car at all times, as when you experience high Gs in a roll, God forbid, your arms will not be able to overtake the Gs and they will be essentially loose jello in the air. So with the window net installed, you can see it kind of covers the best of both worlds. Uh, so for starters, we have it as high up as we can possibly get it without interfering with my helmet. Now inside, the biggest issue is going to be your head clearance. Um, there is a clearance number online. It depends on what rules and regulations you wanna go through and what races you're trying to run. Um, but for this car, we tucked it as absolute far out as possible before hitting the window. Um, so this is as good as it can possibly get in this car right now with the cage setup that we have. And then in terms of the bottom, it will be a standard strap style. These are just tied down to make this fit right now. Um, the actual straps have not been delivered, but we will have the proper FIA or SFI rated straps. They will go on the door bars here and that will hold down this so that when you hit this, it will catch your body um, or your arms or your head, God forbid, whatever it is in the case of a roll. So in that case, window net is done. On to the next thing. So with that finished up, that crosses off two items on the race car safety checklist. And now we can move on to the next one, which is roll cage padding. Now in terms of installing roll cage padding, it's a relatively simple and painless process. Um, you just have to sit and think for a little bit about where your head is going to hit and not just your head, but also a few racing disciplines like to see your legs protected um, because the cage does extend down into the footwell if you have intrusion bars or anything like that. So the cage padding is often also recommended to be down there. God forbid you get into a high G roll or a hit. You don't want your legs banging up against the cage. Um, you know, absolutely worst case causing a break. That's not what we're looking for. So let's get these installed and on to the next one. So after breezing through the cage padding install, we can successfully check that off our checklist. And now we can move on to a steering wheel and quick release, which is arguably one of the most important. So when we talk about installing a quick release in a car, there's a few parts that you need to get familiar with. One is your steering shaft. Two is the hub adapter to actually go from the steering shaft to your quick release. Then three would be the quick release itself. And four would be whatever steering wheel you decide. Now to get these four parts to work properly, we can start with the part that's already attached to the car, your steering shaft. Now most steering shafts are splined in some sort of way and keyed in a way where your hub adapter can only slide on one direction. Not all cars, but most cars. Either way, you want to take your hub adapter and slide it onto your steering shaft, ensuring that it's straight in preparation for the quick release. After it's bolted down, you're then going to grab your quick release and take the hub side and bolt it onto the hub. Outside of that, you just have to bolt the other portion of the quick release onto the wheel and then pull your quick release action and slide it all together. And now your wheel will come on and off. So the quick release now installed, I can show you why it's so important to have one of these in your car as a safety item. Now it is also very convenient to be able to take your wheel on and off getting out of the car. But I will say in terms of a fire or time you need to get it out of the car very quickly and safely, it's already a pain in the butt trying to get up and over the door bars and out of the seat and you know not hit the cage and all that, especially when you have your gear and your helmet and all the harnesses to get off. So if you can make it one step easier to get out of the car in the case of a fire, the quick release and your racing steering wheel is going to be the key to getting in and out safely and quickly. One second takes off the wheel, saves you probably 10 seconds trying to fight it getting out of the car. So with the quick release and the wheel installed, we are finally on the last portion of the checklist where we'll be crossing off the last three items, which is your bucket seat, your harnesses, and your Hans device. Now, when we talk about replacing airbags with race car safety equipment, these three items typically are what people are talking about. Now, we all know the job of an airbag. Quite simply put, when you get into an accident, it detonates, inflates, and prevents you from smashing into your windshield or your steering wheel or anything else in the car, depending on how many airbags you have. Now, when it comes to race cars, there's a few things that people don't think about when trying to keep airbags in their car. If you're trying to do something like rallycross, for example, where your car may be leaving the ground, a lot of airbags are actually triggered by G4 sensors or impact sensors. So if you take your car off a jump and you land, you're very likely to deploy your airbags. 
and God knows that is the last one we want when we're going 60 miles an hour over a jump and we have a hairpin turn coming up next. So in the 36, I will be installing a OMP bucket seat, Schroth racing harnesses in combination with my Zamp Hans device. Now, although rally is one of the things we're going to be doing with the C36, protecting myself from big impact is not the only reason I'm installing these three things in the car. When used properly, a Hans device, a set of harnesses, and a bucket seat will improve driver confidence under hard braking, high speed cornering, and even through acceleration. Now, when it comes to installing these items, we're going to start off with the bucket seat. Step one is to buy yourself an SFI rated bucket seat. Again, I like the OMP WRCR, but the choice is up to you. Next up, you need to buy a set of L brackets or side brackets that can mount the bucket seat to the floor adapter, which is going to be the third item you need to purchase. And that is vehicle specific. Make sure you buy the proper floor bracket for your vehicle. Now get everything bolted up together and put it in the car and test fit and see which one of the slots of your side brackets you want your bucket seat to be mounted in. Again, it's all about comfort and driver confidence. But don't bolt it in fully yet because we still have the harnesses to install. Now, obviously the first step to installing a set of harnesses is to own a set of SFI rated harnesses. Following that, you're gonna need a way to mount them to the car. Hopefully your cage is already installed, so that takes care of the shoulder straps, but down low for the other four straps, we need a way to mount them to the car. That's where eye bolts come in handy. And I commonly see a mistake on a lot of people's builds where they don't use the proper eye bolts and it gets them in trouble in the tech line at the track. As you can see on your screen here, there are two different eye bolts. There's one that's fully looped and one that has a cut in it. The difference between these two eye bolts is that the one with the cut in it can only handle up to 90 pounds of force before it opens up. Whereas on the opposition, the one that's closed can handle up to 1200 pounds of force before it fails. Now, the reason that's such a big issue is that God forbid you get into an accident, those eye bolts will see more than 90 pounds of force from the harnesses trying to keep you in the seat. And if those fail, well, you're gonna have some issues. All right, so in terms of the harnesses, as you saw before, we got the eye bolts all welded in. Everything's painted, hopefully it doesn't rust. Um, so first off, we're going to start with the actual harnesses that come up through the middle of the seat. Now, in terms of attaching a set of harnesses, on the actual harness here, there's a buckle that has to clip through the eye bolt, and then when it clips in, there's a little hole here. Through the hole, you actually have to attach a pin um, almost like a little cotter pin. And what that does is lock this in place so that this can't open up. God forbid you get into an accident, this doesn't open and then the harness comes free. That's the last thing you want in a high G accident. Now repeat that with the other three harnesses that need to attach to the floor. Toss back in your seat and it's time to feed all the harnesses up and through so that way we can work on the shoulder straps. Now when it comes to installing the shoulder straps, all you have to do is take the non-buckle side, feed it up through the shoulder portion of your seat, run it under and around the bar of the cage where the harness is attached to, feed it through the buckle, and then back out of the buckle and through the top. Now this method of tying down the harnesses is crucial as it is the only accepted method by the FIA and other safety rule books so that you do not have to weld any sort of other mounting tabs to the cage of the car to mount your shoulder straps. So with the harnesses in the car, the next step is to get suited up and get everything measured. I'll be right back. Boom, here we are. Got everything I need. Let's get in the car and let's go get suited up. So with the two biggest parts of the puzzle all finished up, we can now talk about the Hans device. Now the Hans device works by resting on the driver's shoulders. Your shoulder straps then come through the seat and rest on the runners of the Hans device, keeping you strapped down into the seat. Now, God forbid you get into an accident, the tether that's located on the top of the Hans device that attaches to your helmet is designed to restrict how much your head and neck moves forward, which saves you from a neck injury. Again, God forbid you get into an accident. Now, just in my town alone, I've seen a lot of guys drive around with a bucket seat and harness set up without using a Hans device. Now, nobody wants to drive on public roads with a Hans device on. That would be quite ridiculous. But it is factually more dangerous to ride around town doing that than just having an airbag in the car. Since the harnesses will keep your body strapped into the bucket seat, which keeps you attached to the car, all the weight of your head in an accident will slide forward, causing your neck to... Well, yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video and everything else on the channel. I hope you learned something in this video, and if you didn't, I hope you at least found it entertaining. If you like what you watched, please stick around and consider subscribing. If you want to let me know anything for future uploads, leave it down in the comment section below. And stay tuned for next video where we do all the onboard electronics and wiring throughout the entire car. So I will see you guys in that episode. Peace.